All right, everybody, welcome to the Reborn Pictures podcast. Uh, this is Marty Martin. I am your host. And today we have a very special guest. We have Leslie Bilansky. How are you, Leslie? I'm great this evening. How are you doing? I'm actually doing very well. Thank you very much. So, uh, Leslie, uh, give us your background. Uh, what, like, what do you do uh, currently and your background in the media industry? Sure. So, uh, I guess I can let me go backwards and then we can move forwards. I was a uh, journalist for about 10 years. I was working with, uh, I worked with CNN and CBS and Court TV. And uh, I love that part of my life. But then I had my child and I kind of segued out of that and got into uh, theater sales. And I've been here in Los Angeles now for 10 years. And I started out doing theater sales for the Hollywood Bowl and the Walt Disney Concert Hall. Uh, and then I segued to a private company that, that contracted with a variety of performing arts organizations like the uh, LA Opera, for instance. And then for the last almost two years now, I've been with Playville, which has been fantastic. Playville, the uh, company, we are headquartered there outside of Times Square. And uh, we do the, the theater programs here in LA when you go, for instance, to the Pantages or the Geffen Theater. Um, you get a program and I am responsible for putting advertisers into the pages of those programs. So as you can see, I've had kind of a varied background. I also am very politically active and uh, I ran for state Senate in New York in 2005, uh, which I loved. Ooh, wow. uh, and I've done, I've worked on several political campaigns as well. So kind of had a, a, a varied background. Wow. It's more, it's more like you've lived multiple lives. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Yes. So, uh, so how did past experiences shape your approach to your current role uh, working at Playbill? You know, what I found is uh, when I was working as a journalist, I was usually coordinating a lot of different elements and putting them together. For instance, is the reporter where they're supposed to be? Is the feed coming in where it's supposed to be? Is the person taking the feed there? So forth and so on. So it was a lot of coordinating elements. And mm -hmm. I found that that carried over into uh, event, where well, I was doing some event planning and some sales because it was about being able to kind of coordinate elements. It also was about being able to uh, you know, adapt because with you, if you're in a breaking news situation, you don't always necessarily know what's what's coming. You know, there could be anything coming around the bend, and you have to be able to adapt and kind of move quickly on your feet to be able to figure that out. So I think that that was uh, those uh, some of those skills there, um, and then certainly you know working in the political field as well. It's about uh, you know, reaching out to a lot of people, being able to communicate to a lot of people, um, and getting your ideas across and things like that. So I think all of those skills then melded into being able to, to do sales. Okay. Okay. Now, what do you enjoy most about your work at Playbill? I love, personally, I'm a very social person. I love mm -hmm. going out and, and meeting new people. And I think really that that is one of the, the best things that I have enjoyed is just getting to the opportunity to meet a lot of different people. Um, you know, I will tell you there's this really nice upside as well, which is my clients tend to be restaurants and, and, and up in, uh, I also work in for Playville in San Francisco. So I have wineries and all of that. So I've had, the, uh, the opportunity to really indulge some of those things as well, which has been great, and, and really build relationships. I have a, a great relationship, for instance, with a fantastic soul food restaurant in San Francisco, a New Orleans soul food restaurant. And I love that. And I go, every time I go back to San Francisco, I make a point of stopping in his restaurant. Um, so I, you know, I really enjoy that. And I enjoy just being around people and meeting new people. Mm, okay. So how do you adapt your strategies and approaches when working with clients from various backgrounds and industries? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I think you have to sort of look at each, you look at each person and business individually to a certain extent. 
And then, you know, you kind of look at like what size is the, is the client and, and, and who they are. Um, and you sort of learn a little bit, for instance, I work with some uh, additional smaller like performing arts organizations that like to use Playbill to promote themselves because Playbill is really about the theater and performing arts community as a whole. So I love being able to offer the opportunity for ha perhaps for some smaller independent theaters to be able to reach a larger audience by being in Playbill. Um, you know, and they understand. So when I'm talking to them, to talk about Playbill is pretty easy because they're in the performing arts organization, uh, performing arts world. Pardon me. So they understand what it is that we do. There are a lot of people that don't know or aren't familiar with what Playbill is. So then you have to kind of back it up a little bit and, and do a little bit more explaining in terms of what it is that we do and how you can, you know, you can reach them. And especially post COVID, I will tell you that there's sensitivity that you really have to have. Because for instance, as you, as you know, as everybody knows, for instance, the hospitality world, the restaurant world got decimated mm -hmm. because of COVID. So mm -hmm. you really have to go in sort of maybe gently because when you're looking at their budgets, you know, what is it, can they afford? Yes, you want to do this for them, but you also have to be sensitive enough to the fact that there are a lot of restaurants and hospitality in general, meaning like hotels and, and things of that nature that are really still struggling to sort of get back up on their feet, even, even though it's been several years, you know, the effects of COVID are still being felt today. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you have to sort of have that sensitivity when you're talking to certain clients, like restaurants, like hospitality, like smaller theaters, and just be conscious and aware of, of where you think their budgets are and what you think they are actually able to do. So how do you stay, I mean, do you stay updated on trends and developments in the theater industry, like on Broadway? And how do you incorporate these insights into your work at Playbill? Well, I happen to work for a fantastic company. And if you go to playbill.com, which is our website, we, we are the, I believe anyway, we are the authority <laughs> on performing arts, especially here in the United States. So mm -hmm. I get all of the feeds and all of the information that comes from that. And we have journalists just at Playbill that just do the theater world and, and, and news pertaining to performing arts. So that really helps, uh, helps me keep up on that. And it's, you know, it is exciting. For instance, both of my theaters now in L.A. and San Francisco this fall are going to have Hamilton. So that's mm -hmm. really, you know, even however many years, and I don't know what it is, but however many years later, Hamilton still garners that excitement. And that's mm -hmm. really, you know, something that's going to be like, hey, we've got Hamilton coming back. So, and it's also my personal favorite musical is Wicked. Um, mm -hmm. And it happens to be the Love 20th it. anniversary of Wicked, believe it or not. So both Wicked is coming again, both to San Francisco and LA, which I'm really excited about. So... You know, you can, you can, um, like I, going back to my old job, I did um, some work for the LA Opera and I, I didn't know anything about opera, honestly. So it was sort of kind of learning it and understanding it. And I did okay, but theater was like, I've been a theater buffer forever. Mm -hmm. So it really uh, was easier for me to, to sell that than say opera, I can do it, um, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, and I certainly did do it, um, but, mm -hmm. but the theater world is something that, and I think you could maybe tell even in my voice, I just, I just adore theater. I mean, I can mm -hmm. tell you that my very first musical that I ever remember was my dad taking me to see Annie when I was very little, and I had an Annie doll with like a little Sandy dog with it. And um, I had the joy January of last year to take my 18 year old to their very first Broadway show, which was amazing. And we, we shared that experience. Um, but I've been lucky enough with the jobs that I've had to get, you know, sometimes complimentary tickets and things. So we've, I've, I've raised them even on theater here, you know, everything from from, oh, I don't know, we've done the kids stuff, like we did Tarzan and Little Mermaid, 
and then 1777. I mean, I could, you know, go on and on. Um, but mm-hmm. I've raised them in, in theater and the theater arts as well. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that's how I sort of keep up with everything. And, uh, and they'll let me know if I'm missing something. Hey, have you heard this is going on in the theater? Or hey, this or that? So if I'm not getting it from Playbill, I'm getting it from my 18-year-old. Okay. <laughs> yes, uh, I myself, I love the theater. I'm like my two biggest, my two big passions are cinema and the theater. Uh, when mm-hmm. I was a child, uh, my parents we used to go to the Pasadena Playhouse uh, sure. at times when I was a kid, and my the the one musical that stood out to me the most was actually um a musical uh well it's already a musical in general but a, a stage adaptation of the wizard of oz and it was okay. a wonderful experience yeah I, I saw the stage play of the wizard of oz anything goes was another one um i did see annie so it was <laughs> it, it's a magical experience for me it- to go to the theater it is. And I, I agree with you, by the way, I'm a huge film buff as well. But there's almost, you know, I say that there's there's nothing like either being in that movie theater with your big bucket of popcorn or being in live theater mm-hmm. is just, um, and you know, you mentioned The Wizard of Oz because we just had The Wiz, for instance, at mm-hmm. Fantasius. Um, so there is just nothing like sitting in that theater and getting that, that live performance. And Mm -hmm. I will also suggest to any of your listeners, if they're in or around or going to visit New York City, that there is now a Broadway museum that is just off of Times Square. And it is phenomenal. It is absolutely, it's like, uh, it takes you about maybe two hours to go through. But you go through it and you progress through the whole history of Broadway. And they have props and they have, And it's really, because I'm also a history buff, it's really interesting, the whole history of Broadway and everything Mm -hmm. the museum does. It's not terribly expensive. And it Mm -hmm. is, so if you have Broadway or theater buffs or whatever, and you're ever in New York City, take the time to go to the Broadway Museum. It's been open, I believe now, two years. So it's a fairly Mm -hmm. new museum there. Mm -hmm. So now, like, since we live in the world of, Post COVID, um, it's amazing. It's it's only been four years since we've had COVID, and um, it, it's greatly affected the the entertainment industry, whether it's theater, music, or cinema. Um, could you discuss the the role of digital media and technology in theater marketing, and how Playbill has embraced these advancements? Um, sure. I can tell you, for instance, going back to our website. Um, I would say that Playbill.com does a lot of great, it's not just the stories, you'll see video. We get, you know, we're lucky enough to get behind the scenes for things like rehearsals and and all of that kind of, uh, those kinds of things. So, um, you know, and I think we we certainly do for Playbill as well. We do e, uh, I call them e-blasts, you know, email marketing. And we do marketing on our Playbill.com website in and of itself which is a great way for people to, uh, to reach our audiences. So I think that that's sort of uh, what you see there and what I've seen, you know? And obviously I think the idea of, the biggest thing I will tell you, I believe, is the idea of working from home, you know, pre-COVID was like, what? What do you mean work from home? I don't, I don't get what, yeah, no. I work from Pasadena and do the San Francisco market. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, uh, we have somebody in San Francisco that does the Chicago market. So, Mm -hmm. you know, those kinds of advancements, I think as well, are really where you, you, uh, I would say to me has been the biggest thing is being able to, to do this job from, from home essentially and doing Mm -hmm. zoom meetings. So I don't, you know, otherwise I'd be like, I have to be in San Francisco every week or something. No, you know, I just Mm -hmm. do zoom meetings. A lot of the time, mm-hmm. you know, I do go up to San Francisco because I'm old fashioned. I'm a believer in in-person, in-person uh, marketing to a certain degree. And I like to go up and, and see people and stuff. But, you know, I can also do Zooms and that kind of helps. I find even Zooms can help open the door and then you can set up that, that in-person meeting. 
So I think that mm -hmm. that's really where uh, a lot of that has come post COVID is the ability to zoom and, and work remotely and, and still be able to accomplish a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, has the, the theater been thriving more post COVID or did it thrive more pre COVID? If you look at the playbill statistics and you can actually go and they keep track of, of Broadway attendance, it is working its way towards where it was pre-COVID. Mm. And in some instances, again, if you're talking about the Hamilton, the big, you know, marquees, like the Hamiltons of the world, um, they are, I believe, and I, I'm not going to swear to this because I haven't seen our stats recently, um, but I believe they are back up to just about where they were. What we mm -hmm. found is that there were people like yourself and me were very passionate about the theater. So we were working really hard to support them any way we could, you know, doing donations or whatever during COVID. But people are like, I'm gonna show my passion by going back to the theater. And I think that there was a, a, a reinvigoration, if that's the right word, of theater in many ways, because people suddenly realized what happened when theater wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And oh my God, how do we, you know, and a lot of people are like, look, people who are out of work and blah, blah. I'm like, that's true. But theater, I believe, and the arts itself play such an important role in our society mm -hmm. from creating messages, bringing people together, um, you know, all those kinds of things. One of the things that I really advocate for um, politically and otherwise is theater art programs in schools. Because mm -hmm. I believe that the theater arts or arts in general are such an important learning tool for kids, regardless of whether they're going to be an actress or a doctor. There's so mm -hmm. much that you learn from the theater arts world. And yeah. um, it's just, there's this fantastic documentary, whose name I can't remember off the top of my head very briefly, though, about uh, this group that came in and taught dancing to an inner city school in New York. And it was mm -hmm. the formal dancing. And the men, the young men, that was like a middle school. The young men had to go out and buy suits. And, and it was like, all of a sudden, these kids that were kind of wild and crazy kids were opening doors and being polite and, and being excited about learning to dance and learning about the music and all of this impact that it made on these kids. And I mm -hmm. think that that's, that's what we saw, you know, obviously that kind of went away during COVID. And everybody's like, oh, my God, we're missing this. We have to make sure we continue to support this so it doesn't ever go away again. It's, it's interesting because, like, as of late, like, we've seen a lot of popular, like, I would definitely say, like, in the Andrew Lloyd Webber era, we had, like, a lot of original plays or um, more, like, you know, we've had Cats, we've had Phantom of the Opera, like, even though, right. like, these were long, older uh, Broadway plays recently... We've been seeing movies being changed into musicals. Like we just had the Back to the Future uh, musical, uh -huh. and yes. then we, they announced La La Land is going to be a musical now. Uh, and then uh, we have Gatsby, the musical. I think they just opened in Germany right now. Oh, okay. Well, that that's yeah. news to me. So you're breaking news. Yeah. Okay. Florence well, Welch and Florence the Machine. Well. You have you have things like the color purple. The new color purple, the one that just came out, which was an adaptation of the theater, of the mm -hmm. musical. And then you yeah. have Wicked, which I can't wait for. You have Wicked mm -hmm. with Ariana Grande coming out um, mm -hmm. as well. So, and I will tell you something else, though, that's really been great to see over the last, even maybe during COVID-ish and moving out, is the diversity in theater. Because you mentioned, yes. and you're absolutely right, and they're fantastic. And you have like Phantom and all of that. But they're very, there wasn't as much diversity, shall we say, not even in terms of the acting, but just in terms mm -hmm. of the storytelling. Yeah. And it's, it's something that I've seen change, like The Strange Loop, which is, I understand, I have not had a chance to see it yet, but it's fantastic. But we have a lot of, which I really like, and I think that, that have come up, a lot of new voices and a lot of new story perspectives and things like that. And it's not perfect it's still got some ways to go in terms of, of diversification 
Um, mm-hmm. But I, I do really like, and I, I've seen sort of, and if you look even at some of the things that are off Broadway and, and, and things like that that are working their way towards Broadway, um, who is, oh, Alicia Keys is mm-hmm. actually doing a musical on Broadway all about her growing up, essentially, mm-hmm. and how she became the kind of superstar that she is today. But for her, it was more about telling about her roots and where she came mm-hmm. from and, and, and how she kind of had this passion for music and where it sort of led her. So, mm-hmm. you know, those are kinds of different voices that we, we haven't seen, I don't think, as much of in the past, let's say, two decades. So I'm really happy as well to see that sort of coming to Broadway. You're always going to mm-hmm. have the Wicked's and the Phantoms and all of that. And that's always going to kind of be there. You have the Lion Kings and Aladdin's for the kids. But to see mm-hmm. some of this, this diversity coming through as well has been very cool. Mm. Now, I would definitely say, like, it's definitely um, uh, obvious that Am- Hamilton was a game changer in yes. the world of Broadway with diversity and then also making, uh, I mean, for, for goodness sakes, who would have thought that a play about Alexander Hamilton would be such a cultural phenomenon? <laughs> no, I don't know if you know, but there is a clip on YouTube where Lin-Manuel Miranda was at the Obama White House, pre, right pre-Hamilton, but he was oh, at the yes, art, art event. Yeah. At the White House, and he said, "You guys are going to think I'm crazy, but this is an idea I have." And he did like a two or three minute snippet. He's like, "That's just something I'm working on," and everybody's mm-hmm. like, "Yeah, okay, Hamilton. What? Nobody's going to watch anything about a president. <laughs> what? No." So yes, it, it 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 did change quite a lot, and I think you know he's fantastic. I don't know if you've seen In the Heights, which was yes, I saw the film. I saw the film. Okay, which is great, yes. And the, that was kind of his first foray in, into that, which mm-hmm. is, again, that was bringing different voices uh, to Broadway as well. But Hamilton did sort of open that door, I think, and prove that you can be, you can tell different kinds of stories and be successful doing it. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I, I remember um, just, I, I feel like Hamilton ignited a huge interest amongst mainly uh, Gen Z and then the, la- the latter half of millennials to want to go to the theater. Uh, because I remember for a very long time, the theater was seen as more as a luxurious outing rather than a regular thing to, to do, like compared to going to the movies, mainly because it, it is pretty pricey for a lot of the big plays and musicals. But I feel like now it's becoming more normalized as an actual option of entertainment to go to um, uh, more often than people did before. Yeah, I agree with you. And it's still, unfortunately, still, especially Broadway, uh, unless you know the tricks a little bit. And there are a few tricks. Um, But um, Broadway has become kind of expensive, but it is become a little bit more, I think, you're right. Something that people are like, wow, you know, this is something that's kind of cool. And it was a way to bring in a, a new generation, which I think uh, is then reflected, like I was just saying, in some of the other voices that are starting to come out, too. And it was it was a great way to, to bring people in. Um, I will tell you, so my child was in middle school in a performing arts school, and I took uh, myself and several PTA moms gathered a group of, of the uh, kids and took them all to Hamilton when it was playing in Orange County, actually, in Costa Mesa. And it was remarkable. I mean, these kids, and they were kids at that point, um, were, um, like, talking Hamilton every day and, like, singing Hamilton every day. And it was, you know, it was remarkable to see. And it was, it was so much fun to go and um, be able to take these kids and see them getting excited about theater. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, with, uh, of course, like Broadway, you know, we see a lot of successes. We also see some musicals not do too well. Is there a musical that you could think of that you very well enjoyed, but unfortunately it underperformed on Broadway? Not that I can think of. 
does probably happen. And there are things that close fairly quickly that you're like, oh, that's kind of closing. Although I couldn't tell you what they were off the off the top of my head. Um, so I will tell you, I've been surprised. <clears throat> you mentioned Back to the Future because it only hit Broadway two years ago. So for mm -hmm. me, the fact that it's already touring, a lot of times Broadway shows used to be on Broadway for quite a long time before they would before they would tour, you know, mm -hmm. go across the country. And I am uh, happily surprised because I'm a big uh, Michael J. Fox fan. I'm really looking forward to that just to go and mm -hmm. have fun at the theater. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I'm surprised now to a certain degree how much, how quickly things are kind of turning around and being able to tour, which is great because then that gives more people access to those shows. Yes. Yes, definitely. And it's, uh, I think they also, I think they just did, what, a, a Stranger Things show as well? Uh, um, that I'm not familiar with. It's possible. Um, but, um, you know, there's all kinds of, of shows and stories and uh, that, are, that are going on. So, and there's stuff opening all the time on Broadway. So, you know, you can, you can keep up with all of that on playbills.com, but there's always, you know, new shows. And it's interesting to see the progression, like the Alicia, uh, the, um, <clears throat> was it Alicia Keys? Alicia Keys started off Broadway and then uh -huh. it did, it did well enough. And so did Hamilton, by the way, actually, Hamilton actually started off Broadway and it did so well and, and got such great word of mouth that the financial people were able to go and look at it and say, oh, well, I think it'll make money then if we take it to Broadway, so let's take it to Broadway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because unfortunately in many ways it is all about the money because getting a show on Broadway is, and I, I don't know an exact number to tell you, but actually producing a show and getting it on Broadway is incredibly expensive. Mm. So you have to be able to make sure you have all the elements in place that doesn't mean, like you said, there are shows that go, oh, they were on for a month that didn't work, let's close. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, in the end, it's just, a, it's unfortunate. But, you know, just like any industry to a great extent, it's about the numbers. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. uh, you know, so, um, you know, even just to say, though, oh, you were on Broadway for, you know, a month is better than to say, you know, you never made Broadway, but. But that's where I think a lot of the, I believe, and again, don't quote me on this too, I believe A Strange Loop was off Broadway as well. And then mm. it got uh, such great feedback that it ended up on Broadway and winning the Tonys, I believe. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, and it's, it's interesting, I just looked it up on the Playbill uh, website. Um, there actually is a Stranger Things stage play. It opened in oh. London. Yeah, okay. in December. And it's well, going to be a trilogy. Oh, my gosh. Well, and you'll find as well, like, Back to the Future started in London. And mm -hmm. then it got, it actually, everybody was kind of like, yeah, okay, it's some kitschy, you know, movie thing. But it got fantastic reviews in mm -hmm. London. And yeah. then, um, and then carried over to the States. So mm -hmm. you do find sometimes that London is maybe a bit of a testing ground as well for some things. So, but mm -hmm. you're, you're breaking news to me. I was not aware of the, uh, the Stranger Things. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, what are some, because like we definitely see musicals being adapted into films. Do you feel like that there are some musicals that are just made to be musicals and shouldn't be made into a movie for a cash grab? Uh, let's talk about cats or let's not talk about cats, <laughs> right? <laughs> Right? Taylor Swift so, couldn't even bring in a crowd. I know. So I, I think therein lies a good example. I will also tell you, I did not see it, but um, Dear Evan Hansen is an amazing musical in and of itself. Oh, I saw that. And it, it tells, I don't know if you're familiar with the story or not, but it tells a very poignant, extraordinarily well done story. Mm -hmm. And the music is fantastic. The movie from everything I heard was absolutely awful. Mm. So, which is sad to me because like I said, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you know, this is a fun fact. The, the creative people behind Dear Evan Hansen are the same creative people behind La La Land and are the same creative people behind 
the movie The Greatest Showman, which mm-hmm. I don't understand, by the way, why that movie hasn't been made into a musical yet with Hugh Jackman, because that is one mm-hmm. of my favorite movie musicals. Mm-hmm. But the same people that did that did um, La La Land, did Dear Evan Hansen, and did The Greatest Showman. But the Dear mm-hmm. Evan Hansen movie, I understand, was just awful. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, what were your thoughts? I don't know if you've seen this film, uh, Tick, Tick, Boom. Oh, it was fantastic. Yeah. Yes, I loved it. The yeah, scene it, in the, it, you've seen it? Yes, I have. I saw it, on, uh, of course, on Netflix. But, like, uh, I, I'm, I'm just a Jonathan Larson fan. Yes. He's just uh, a genius. Yes. I saw Rent. Um, I was living in New York. It was 1995 when I believe Rent came out. And I stood in line for hours to mm. get seats to go see the original Rent on Broadway. Mm. Um, tick, tick, boom. I was going to say the diner scene was my favorite, just about my favorite scene. When all of the iconic mm. Broadway people kind of make their cameos was, yes. I love that. And yes, Jonathan Larson is a genius, and Rent is just absolutely phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Yes. I was a little bit disappointed because I would have enjoyed it. I, I mean, it played in select theaters. I was unaware of that, but I, it's definitely a movie I would have enjoyed to see it on the big screen. Yeah, and that was Lin-Manuel Miranda's directorial debut. Yes. But yes, yes. that was a fantastic movie. Now, um... Uh, another thing that I was going to mention. So, like, um, take us to, like, when you work, like, what, what, what for, with Playbill. So, are there, like, is it a, just one headquarters or there's two locations? Our, our main headquarters are Times Square, just uh-huh. outside of Times Square. So, and then we have people like myself that work remotely all across the country mm-hmm. for a variety of cities. So, you know, you can look there and see. If you go to our media kit, even, I mean, we are everywhere, just as an example, Chicago, Minneapolis, Baltimore, Miami. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and here in LA, we're both Northern and Southern you know, we're California, we're Northern and Southern California. Mm-hmm. So, but our, mm-hmm. our main headquarters are um, the Times Square. Mm-hmm. And it's really interesting is my boss hired me and I, in, in April of, uh, 2022, and I didn't meet him in person until December or until January of 23. Oh wow! So um, it was all via Zoom. You know, you were talking about technology. It was all via Zoom. Mm-hmm. So um, and I had there were a lot of people that I had been emailing with that do a variety of things in the mm-hmm. office for us, from you know getting us playbills as as examples that we can hand out. And, and doing just kind of the, the, the work that goes into what we do, people that handle our emails and email blasts for them and the digital marketing mm-hmm. team, whatever. All these people, I had been emailing them for seven months, never met them. So mm. I got the opportunity to actually go to the office uh, and meet them. And it was nice to be able to say, I can put a face with a name now and, uh, mm-hmm. and do all of that. So, um, so that's generally how we work. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now it, it was interesting uh, because I took um, I attended uh, Norco College and I took theater uh, there, uh-huh. and uh, my professor, his name is uh, Walter Buck Stevens. He worked on Broadway, uh, I believe, if I can remember. He he he, he was on Wicked uh, too. Okay. So uh, yeah, so one thing that I really he was my favorite prof- my favorite professor next to my philosophy professor, but one thing that he really wanted to get through his students, and you mentioned this before, is the importance of the arts, of how so important mm-hmm. they are to culture and just our human existence. And he was saying yeah. because he went on a trip to Europe and he said it's so embarrassing how America is the face of entertainment, yet they see it as a commodity rather than see it as an art form. Absolutely. And, you know, I don't know. Did you get a chance to watch the did you watch the Oscars? Oh, no, I didn't because I I don't have cable, so I couldn't find it anywhere. But I saw the results. I saw all the results. What I was going to say is, and I feel this way, certainly, and theater does the same thing. But um, just to talk about film a little bit, um, there were two things. 
the the film that won best documentary was about Russia and Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And the the director got up and was extraordinarily poignant and said, I would have given anything to never having made this movie, film, documentary, which is where my passion lies. I've worked on documentaries. I love documentary film, absolutely mm-hmm. adore it. And I have been privileged enough to work on a couple of documentaries. Um, but he said, I wish to God that I had never made this movie. He said, I would mm-hmm. give up anything not to have had to make this movie about Russia bombing my country. Mm. Um, so, you know, you have that. And then there was a movie as well, and it won Best International Film. And I just saw it right before the Oscars. Um, and it's, it's the story. It's a Holocaust-related story, but it's, it's not sort of. Basically, very briefly, what it is, it's the story of the Nazi commander that lives next door to Auschwitz and how just on the other side of that fence, his family was living this idyllic life and the kids were playing in the pool and everything. Well, what was on the other side? But what the real story is and what I took from it and applies to today is how you can turn a blind eye or a blind ear to mm-hmm. anything, to evil, to, to the world's oppressions, to whatever the case may be, you know? And it's just really interesting how, and I don't want to get too political or whatever, but it's really interesting how that applies to maybe what's going on with Israel mm-hmm. and, and the things that are going on there and, you know, maybe not paying attention. We have mm-hmm. something right mm-hmm. on the other side of our wall, metaphorically speaking. But we mm-hmm. are choosing to continue to live this little idyllic, you know, swimming pool, raising a garden, doing the whole nine yards, pretending or choosing not to hear and see what's on the other side of that wall. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I think you're talking about making an impact. And I think that's the arts in general uh, mm-hmm. from theater. You know, I, I will tell you, my favorite story is Wicked, but the mm-hmm. best performance that I've ever been to was um, Natalie Portman um, played Anne Frank. It was right before Natalie Portman was the Star Wars princess. Okay. Um, and she played Anne Frank. And we, I went to the play, which was the Diary of Anne Frank. And I've never heard a theater be quiet. Like, usually after a show, people are talking, but and I've mm-hmm. never really cried that I remembered at a theater before. Mm-hmm. And the impact that she made, she was phenomenal. She was mm-hmm. absolutely phenomenal as Anne Frank. And the impact and the, 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 the feeling you could get just in the theater because it was quiet. And you could tell people were still kind of taking in and absorbing everything that we just saw. And the impact that that made is something I will never forget. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Now, um, um, it, it's interesting because I think one of the reasons why America doesn't take the arts seriously as they should, especially if they're the face of the world, when the world looks to entertainment, um, I think it's because, you know, unlike in Europe, in during World War II, America didn't have the Nazi regime trying to destroy artwork and erase right. people's culture by dismantling their sculptures, burning their books, destroying yep. their paintings. Yep. Yep. And because we never had that threat of our culture being destroyed and disintegrated, I, I feel there's a sense of ungratefulness for the arts. I think that that's true. I think, though, you'll see it um, and it's really interesting. You want to talk about musicals that didn't do as well as they should very briefly. Barry Manilow did a mm-hmm. musical recently about a terrific group of uh, men in Europe, pre-World War II, heading into World War II, who were like the top marquee in Europe. And they were this mm-hmm. men's singing group, choir, whatever the case may be. But they were Jewish. Mm-hmm. And how what happened when the Nazis came in and totally, you know, basically dismantled them and the whole nine yards. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I kind of went off on a tangent there for a second. I'm sorry. But I, I, um, I agree with you, you know, that that's true. Oh, what I was going to say is, though, you will see, for instance, when Congress was threatening, threatening to cut the PBS budget 
Yes. Just found a lot of passionate people suddenly coming out and going, no, 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 no. You can't, you can't do that. This is, you know, PBS is, is sacred in terms of the way it promotes the arts and everything. And we can't cut their, cut their budgets. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I think you see that. And I think you see it in the theater resurgence that we're having now that people appreciate it because it did sort of get taken away per se by COVID. Um, Mm -hmm. But you're right. I don't know that we quite appreciate them or have the, the same sense of them that we did, you know, because of what happened in Europe. So, um, uh, uh, so also, uh, what, what, what's some advice that you have for, let's say, somebody wants to pursue to work in the theater industry, like someone fresh out of theater school or business and they, they want to work at Playbill? What, what's some advice that you would give to someone? Well, now, Playbill is different because it's not the performing arts. Like, you're not going to Playbill to get a job as an actor or something. So that is, I do qualify, that is a little different. Um, But what I will say is, and when I say about anything, I said this when I was a news producer, when I was a documentary producer, uh, when I was working with politicians. It's sort of what you bring is your passion for whatever it is that you really want to do. So... Mm -hmm. You know, um, and the advice I have is be willing to do anything just about, you know, in terms of understanding that you kind of start at the bottom and work your way up. Um, and I would say as well, know your know your theater, know your industry, bring your passion with you. Um, and just, you know, if you're really good at sales and this is what you like, then you know, be able to do that. You have to be able to, because we are remote, there's Mm -hmm. a certain skill set that there are some salespeople that don't feel, that are great in person, but don't feel comfortable necessarily getting on the phone or doing Zoom. So Mm -hmm. make sure that you're comfortable with all of that. So I had almost 10 years of doing phone sales and telemarketing sales before I went to Playbill. And Mm -hmm. that, and I had some great, bosses and and teachers to sort of give me that skill because i gotta tell you honestly when i first came and i came to the the hollywood bowl i almost got fired because i was so nervous Mm. and i didn't understand what i was going and they were blessed enough to say hey i think you can do this let's get you another platform so i moved from the hollywood bowl into the walt disney concert hall and i i did great so it, it really helps to have good mentors and people that can see what you have inside of you but have a great phone voice. One of my bosses said, which I take with me everything I do, they can hear you smile. And it's Mm. very true because your voice conveys your emotions. Yes. So, you know, that's what I would say. And then my last thing is just network, 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 Mm -hmm. because you never know who you're going to meet or Mm -hmm. what connection is to what connection is to what connection. So, you know, I was lucky enough with Playbill that I found somebody, LinkedIn is a fantastic tool, by the way. So that's Mm -hmm. another suggestion. It's only like $30 a month and I use it just about every day. Um, Mm -hmm. And truly just to find who are the decision makers in some of the companies and businesses that I'm looking at. So, you know, network, network, network. You know, find mm-hmm. there's a lot of, in today's uh, day and time, there's a thing called Eventbrite, and there are yes. free events. There are events that don't cost a lot of money. Um, you know, you don't have to be going to a $200 cocktail party all the time. Um, and just network like heck, because you truly you just never know what's going to happen or, or who you could meet that's attached to somebody that's attached to somebody down the road that you might even come back. Uh, Very briefly, I had a story. I was doing an event for a theater. We were in Virginia for a little bit. I was doing an event for a theater and uh, I was doing an Oscar fundraising party actually for the Charlottesville, for the, uh, pardon me, for the Virginia Film Festival. And I had to bring in sodas and stuff. It was like a 300 person party. So I worked with the soda vendor to make sure we had everything we need. You know, go down the road about four months and I get this phone call uh, from this company called Cheer Wine, which is the Southern Cherry Soda, which is a subsidiary of Pepsi. And I said, yes. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I am doing a concert for this big um, bluegrass country group. 
and uh, we are the sponsors of the concert, and we need somebody to put together a pre-concert dinner, a post-concert party, help us out. And my Pepsi distributor told me I should call you. Mm -hmm. So you just, who would have ever thought that I was just working with this Pepsi distributor? And it ended up being a huge event that I managed in Charlottesville. Um, you know, uh, a whole week of events that I helped them coordinate. I did a big party. I worked with the band and did an after party. All of this stuff because I worked well with the Pepsi guy. Mm -hmm. So you just never know who you're going to meet and what connection you can have. So, and mm -hmm. stay relevant, stay, you know, all the social medias, Twitter and, or X as they call it, pardon me. But more importantly, in today's day and time, I think it's more Instagram. Um, you also asked me earlier about technology and I went to the event, I believe, where I met you and we are just now exchanging phones mm -hmm. instead of cards because we can read mm -hmm. each other's QR codes and, and things like that, which is, uh, you know, it's not just handing out that, that business card per se anymore. Um, right, exactly. So, it's, it's much yeah, easier. It is much easier. So that's, the, that's the, you know, the best piece of advice I give people is be, you know, be passionate about what you're doing. Know your, know your subjects, know your shows, all of that, and just network and have fun. I mean, truly, mm -hmm. it's work. But for me, and I told my boss this, I said, I've done a lot of jobs. And I feel like I've made an impact in documentary work and news work but I've never had a job where I've had so much fun. It's work, mm -hmm. but for me, it's been so much fun to get to know mm -hmm. people, to explore the city and learn the restaurants and the, you know, the goings on and all of that. It's just fun. So have yeah. fun with it, especially when you're doing something like theater, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's impactful and important and fun. Now, uh, finally, uh, what upcoming projects or initiatives are you excited about at Playbill and what can we expect to see from the company in the future? Well, uh, like I said, I'm really excited about the fact that we are bringing Hamilton back, uh, both to L.A. and San Francisco, and we're bringing Wicked back. And in L.A., we're also going to have <clears throat> several months of Harry Potter because Harry uh, Potter is divided up into like two different shows. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think that is, is where we are uh, in terms of locally. So, and some, some new shows we talked about, like Back to the Future, some classics as well, because you always have to have the classics um, that are coming too. So in terms of Playbill itself, you know, I don't want to presume to speak for the company as a whole, because uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's not my, my purview. But I will say, you know, just that we're the leader in performing arts, news, and, you know, I will tell you as well, and I don't know if you know, but um, every year we do big pride uh, month and we mm -hmm. always did in, uh, in Times Square, they always do a huge pride event. And every year it seems to be getting bigger and bigger. So that's really uh, exciting and something we always look forward to where we have various theatrical acting people and theatrical actors and, and, and musicians and everybody that comes together and they do this huge kind of blowout party in Times Square for pride. Uh, but that's uh, very important to them. You know, Playbill's uh, about theater and, and the gentleman that actually, it's a third generation owned Playbill now. So the uh, father, let's say, started this in the 50s and then his son took over and now his son is taking over. Um, oh, okay. And Playbill has been around very briefly since late 1800s. It started out as a one sheet that people just got in the theater and then moved progressively until the, the Birch family, which has it now, took it mm -hmm. over. And um, the story goes, for instance, our iconic yellow print that we have that everybody kind of now recognizes as our logo was because the yellow, um, the yellow color was the least unexpected, was the least inexpensive and expensive least expensive color to do so that's how playbill oh, wow. became yellow when they were trying to figure out how to make it printed yellow was the cheapest ink so that's how it became yellow and black and it um, became iconic uh yes absolutely but playbill has always been an, an alex and their family um and the, the family that runs playbill is just phenomenal it's it's wonderful to work for a you know, you don't think of Playbill as a small, I kind of think of it as a small family-owned business. It's not this, like, huge corporate behemoth, necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's it's run by this family still um, and overseen by terrific people. 
and they are always, he's a huge supporter of Playbill as well, is a huge supporter of the arts in general, performing arts, and all of the mm -hmm. kinds of things that go with that. And so, you know, I think that's just going to continue, you know, mm -hmm. from here on out. I just see that continuing and, and, and growing. And, uh, and like I said, we do the Pride events and, and, uh, and all kinds of things like that. So it's just continuing the good works we're doing now. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Leslie, it was great speaking with you. I would definitely love to have you come back on the podcast, talk more, more theater stuff, and maybe even okay. delve into musical films uh, for sure. That sounds great. That sounds great. You know, the uh, the Tonys will be coming up soon, so maybe we can we can chat yes. once the Tony nominations come out and and uh, and kind of go over that and see what we think about the uh, all the nods that are coming out, much like the Oscars. Very, it's very true. Very true. I think like I, I'm a huge buff when it comes to award shows. I love award shows. Yes, and that's on my bucket list. I've yet to be to the Tonys, so that is on my bucket list. And hopefully, working with Playbill one day, I will actually get to the uh, the uh, Tony Awards in person. Oh, that would be wonderful. Well, Leslie, you have a good evening, and we'll keep in touch. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a good night.